So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. On today's episode, Dr. Amanda Lorinkinyard talks on the inhibitory learning model of exposure and the treatment she helped develop, positive affect treatment. Dr. Lorin Ginyard is a clinical psychologist at the Concord Center and previously an assistant clinical director at CBT California. She is a certified cognitive behavioral therapist through the Academy of Cognitive Therapy and is a foundationally trained DBT therapist. During her graduate training, she did research focused on improving the treatment effectiveness for anxiety and depression through a more dimensional approach to therapy. She is a frequent presenter at national conferences, such as the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, and the Association for Psychological Science. Now on to the interview. All right, Amanda, thanks so much for coming on the show and taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, One way that I like to start the show is to ask people their theoretical orientation, like what type of therapist are you and why you fell into that camp? Sure. So I am definitely a cognitive behavioral therapist. And, you know, when we say cognitive behavioral therapy, that's a pretty big umbrella that we talk about. Um, So I definitely fall under that umbrella. And, you know, with cognitive behavioral therapists, some people fall into the cognitive side of the cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. Some fall into the behavioral side of the cognitive behavioral therapy and some kind of are in the middle. I fall more on the behavioral side. Um, And what that means is I really work with people on their, you know, maladaptive behaviors or lack of behaviors and how that maintains their psychopathology. Um, And yeah, so the reason why I fall under that camp is because, you know, when I worked in graduate school with Michelle Krask, who is a very big behaviorist, and she's really big on the side of exposure, I was able to really see how modifying behaviors and engaging in things that you are afraid of can really help with treating anxiety. So Mm. I fall more into that camp. And when you think about like, behaviors and like the, the, the go-to where everybody thinks about it, at least in the therapy field is for anxiety. Mm-hmm. Is that also where you lean for, you know, depression or for anger or things, things like that as well? Yeah. So I primarily work, um, with exposure for anxiety disorders in addition to depression. So that's kind of where my expertise is, is with the anxiety disorders and with depression, we kind of phrase it a little bit differently for anxiety versus depression, but essentially it's the same thing is how to re-engage with behaviors that are more effective for your life and will help you reduce the anxiety and the depression. Okay. So with the, and we're going to get more into like how this works for, for anxiety. Uh, but with anxiety, we're having people doing things, uh, that they're, that they're scared of. And I know that, that you, you talk about, well, this, the, how, the, how much fear they have, it doesn't matter as much. And, and that's going to be a cool conversation, but with people with depression, uh, is it for them to engaging also with things that, that they're scared to do, or is it more so that they're not as, uh, active? So we're just trying to get them going. Yeah. So for people with depression, it's more framed around doing behaviors that will get them active, will get them up and out and doing things that they either used to enjoy doing or currently enjoy doing. With depression, a lot of times people will say, you know, I have no energy to get up and get out. I have no motivation. I don't really like doing anything anymore. So the behaviorism there, the behavioral component there would be to think about what are things that you used to like doing before you were depressed? Or what are things that sound like they could be things that you enjoy doing? And how do we get you engaged in those activities with, you know, the goal being mood improvement or a mood boost when you're engaging in those activities? Mm -hmm. And so taking a more, um, and, and, and of course you're not like a pure, pure, just behaviorism, but taking a more behaviorist approach, why do we even have this, the cognitive part? Like why are you part of CBT if you're just doing the behavior stuff? That's that's a really good question. And I think in the field, too, there's a lot of conversation around, like, do we even need the cognitive component? And there are people who, of course, are in the cognitive camp who would very much disagree with me saying that altogether. Um, But yes, I do think there is a role. um, I think there is a I think there's a 
it makes sense to have the cognitive component there for some people. However, I think it's not necessarily needed for all people. And here's why I say that. When we are doing behavioral work, so when we're doing, for example, exposure for anxiety, so when we're facing our fears for anxiety, what we're actually doing is we're doing a cognitive component in the behavioral work anyways. So if you're asking somebody to engage in something that they're afraid of, and we're asking them to see like, does the thing that I'm afraid of actually happen? You're doing cognitive work too, because you're asking them like, what is the data? Like, what did you just experience doing this exposure? And so that is cognitive work. So actually, you know, when we do exposure now, and when we, when we do CBT now, we do exposure first before the cognitive component, because there is some cognitive work that happens in exposure. For people who get really stuck in their thoughts, though, who have a lot of negative thoughts about themselves, who have a lot of negative thoughts about like potential experiences that they're going to engage in, I think the cognitive work can be important, but there always is the behavioral work that can be done too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think when people often think about therapy or changing their thinking, they think, well, you fight thinking with thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but basically you're saying there, there's other pathways. It may be more in your, your case, you're saying that's a more powerful pathway is that you change the behavior to change the thinking. Yeah. Because then you have more direct evidence because when you're doing the cognitive piece, like you said, you're challenging thinking with thinking. The part about challenging thoughts is you have to come up with evidence, right? For and against a negative thought. When you're doing exposure, you're actually getting your data right there. So you don't actually have to think about like, what do, what do I know the data to be? You're actually experiencing the data and you have it firsthand. So while it may be more indirect, instead of saying like, you know, let's look at your thoughts, you're targeting your thoughts by doing behavior work. Mm. Yeah. And I don't know if I ever explicitly said this on the, sh on the show, but I, I'm, I'm like a midlineist uh, in the middle, but I think that like, my personality has always been mid, like I always just take the middle of, yeah. of, of most things. Well, not most things, but anyway. Um, but I, the way that I, I sort of see it is that we alter the cognitions in order to help people automatically, or maybe not so automatic, maybe with encouragement, change, change the way that they're behaving, but actually mm -hmm. the behavior change actually changes their more deep beliefs. Um, That's what we like to think. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also think about that a bit with imaginal exposure to thought exposure, like doing it more just like thinking about um, the scared thing happening rather than doing anything over and over. I think about it as reducing the anxiety enough that the person then actually behaves differently, which might be mm -hmm. like more of like a behavioral exposure, which mm -hmm. then changes the belief. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense too. You know, I can totally see, you know, that direction as well. And, you know, with things like imaginal exposure, if we have someone who needs an imaginal exposure, like we have to, we have to go in that direction and we have to use thoughts there as well. Right. Because if there's something that we can't directly, you know, expose someone to like, for example, a trauma memory, right. Mm -hmm. Or for example, like someone with generalized anxiety disorder who may have this fear that we, that is something that could potentially happen in the future that we can't expose them to then using thoughts for exposure makes sense as well. Makes sense. And then, you know, I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that I think that that then leads people to have more adaptive behavior and that's like a huge healing component in the process. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I agree with that as well. I think that that can actually, you know, have somebody reduce their anxiety enough to then engage in exposure and that can be part of the healing process. And on the other side, I do think that if you present like a solid rationale for exposure and why you're going to, you know, be engaging in exposures, then you may, may be able to bypass the cognitive part there too. Mm. Okay. So let's jump into exposure for anxiety disorders. That's kind of like this, this global thought. Uh, yeah. so what is exposure? Uh, how does it work and how would you like explain this? So, so a client's coming in and they're saying, I'm scared of this. And you're saying, okay, great, let's go do that. You know, how do you, <laughs> how do you break this down for people? Yeah. So it's, it's funny because exactly what you're saying, like you're expecting somebody to come into your office and say, I have anxiety about this. I'm afraid of this thing. And you're going to say, cool, well, we're going to go do that thing now that you're, you're the most afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so the way that we, you know, talk about it with clients is that, you know, 
first of all, this is the gold standard way of reducing anxiety. And also, you know, we explain kind of the role of avoidance. We explain the role of avoidance in, you know, the things that they're afraid of. So say somebody, for example, comes in um, with social anxiety, they're anxious about, you know, engaging in social situations, calling people on the phone, going to social engagements, whatever it may be. And we say to them, okay, so you avoid going to a party if somebody invites you to go. Um, What happens to your anxiety when you avoid going to the party? They're like, oh, I don't have anxiety if I avoid going to the party. It feels great, you know? And then, okay, cool. So then when you are approached with an invitation for a party the next time, what happens to your anxiety? It goes right back to where it always is. And so we explain to them that avoidance of the thing that they're afraid of actually feels really good in the short term, but does nothing to help their anxiety in the long term. It just maintains it. So when we talk about the rationale for facing your fears, is like we want to get you into these situations to show you that either you can tolerate the anxiety associated with these things that you're afraid of, and the thing that you think is going to happen likely won't occur. Mm-hmm. So we provide that rationale is like, this is the way that in the long term, your anxiety is really going to reduce because we're going to teach you some stuff. Whereas in the moment, if we're avoiding, that doesn't help your anxiety. It just maintains it. And so we also give, you know, some examples, like I would say to somebody, um, so say you are someone who's afraid of water. You're so afraid of water. You won't go to the beach. You won't like take a bath. You won't watch water on TV. Right. And I asked the patient, like, what would you do if you knew somebody who was afraid of water? It was really interfering with their life. They really wanted to go to the beach. What would you suggest that they do? And then the client typically says, oh, well, I would have them like walk out, you know, go to the beach and like walk up walk in the water up to their ankles and show them that it's okay. And then, you know, maybe walk in a little further and then maybe go in the shallow end of a pool. And so that's how we explain the rationale. I'm like, yes, exactly. And that's what we're going to do with your social anxiety. We're going to do it little by little to show you that it's not as dangerous as you think it is. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it's just maintain by avoiding it maintains, but in other cases it actually grows where, where grow like, so now like, Oh, I could go to the pool, but I'm just not going to, I'm only going to go waist deep. And then it's like, well, I'll go to the pool, but I only put my feet in. And then it's like, well, then I, I, I can't go in the water. I can't go to the pool. You know, I can't yes. go. So in some people it maintains, but some people it grows. Right. And some people it grows and that can be really debilitating and really impairing in your life because then your life can become so small that you're not engaging in anything that you, that you need to be engaging in to like have have a life that is valuable or that is, you know, goal oriented for yourself. So if you're not making any phone calls, if you're not engaging with friends, if you're, you know, not like going to work interviews, then you're in your house all day. And then, you know, it's really impairing to your life. So yes, Mm. avoidance can definitely exacerbate the problem as well and get worse. Yeah. And people might be thinking, well, how would that happen with water? But if you think so more so like people are scared of snakes, right? Yes there could be a snake outside or people that are scared of dogs or cats or something like that. You know, it depends on what the fear is, but it could really shrink, shrink your world. Yes, absolutely. When you think about fear of dogs, for example, that's a really, that's, that's a really good example because say there's a dog that lives at the end of your street. So you decide not to take, you know, not to go that way. If you take a walk, um, you know, when you go down your street, because the dog is at the end of the street, that's avoidance. But then say, for example, you see, you know, your neighbor walking that dog past your house and you're like, oh, well, I don't know if the neighbor's going to be walking that dog when I decide to go outside. So I'm not going to go outside at all. And then, mm-hmm. and it, you know, gets bigger from there. And, and so then the complete opposite, we call it exposure, but I often call it approach, like avoidance approach. Mm-hmm. I think it just makes a bit more, it, it makes a bit more sense when you, when you put in that. So I always talk to people about approaching uh, to get healthier rather than avoiding. Exactly. Yeah. We use exposure, you know, in the lab, you know, when we talk amongst colleagues and when we, and when we talk with patients, we can call it approach avoidance. And I think like talking about it is like a face your fears, um, type of approach. I think that, you know, makes a lot of sense because when we are approaching our fears and when we are approaching rather than avoiding, then those types of situations are what will help you reduce the distress and make your life more, you know, make your life larger and more fulfilling. 
Mm-hmm. Um, What's your thoughts on on triggers? You know, there there was like a time in school where people were being taught know your know your triggers, avoid them. So where were you on the camp? Is it approach all triggers? Like what what do people do here with triggers? Well, I think the answer is always it depends, right? And so I'm also I also do DBT, and when we talk about DBT, we're like it depends. You know, the answer is always it depends. But when we think about triggers, yeah, I I would say know what your triggers are. And at the same time, if your triggers are causing you to avoid certain things or you're avoiding certain triggers, then that also may be impairing in some way, you know? So there are, there may be certain triggers or cues that you have that signify danger to you. Um, And when we think about exposure, we actually want to change the way that you kind of think about your triggers and the way that you think about your cues. And rather than, you know, trigger equaling danger, we want trigger to equal not necessarily danger and almost safety at the same time. So I'm kind of in the camp of, you know, know what your triggers are. Yes, that's important. And depending on what the triggers are and how they are impacting you, approach those triggers. Mm -hmm. And should you run at the triggers all the time or is like a reasonable amount of avoidance of like, you know, like doing it within reason, uh, a sensible approach? I would say doing it within reason is a sensible approach. We definitely don't want you to be like, okay, go for it. Run into all your triggers. Just go, go, go. It needs to make sense, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. adaptive to be avoidant of certain things, right? We definitely don't want you to do anything dangerous or do anything that would actually harm you in some way. So it's, I think it's important to to consult with someone also about what like you're doing with your triggers. Yeah. And then when you're going through like anxiety treatment or maintenance, like you don't have to be constantly in like a wrestling match. Like you could take like, I I, I often talk a mallet to the head versus like, you know, like a spoon to the head. Like, you know, you don't have to do the mallet. You could just do the spoon over and over and it's going to cause, you know, it's not going to hurt you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. The spoon to the head approach for spoon sure. I mean, head. if you, if you're feeling up to it, if you're feeling like you want to do something difficult and it makes sense and it's safe, go for it. Otherwise. Yeah. If you do enough small exposures over and over, then you will absolutely see the same results. Yeah. And don't ask me where I got mallet to spoon. I just think I just <laughs> said that one time, just trying to come up with something and I just, just stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep my spoon metaphor. Um, okay. So, um, There's this traditional model of exposure therapy, and then there's this inhibitory learning model. Um, And a main reason for you coming on the show was to start teaching people, like, what is the difference between this? So what was the old model? And then what is this new model? Yeah. So the habituation model, and I'll explain what that is in, in a second, is the traditional exposure model. So exposure has been going on. We've been doing exposure for a long time. And there are still several psychologists who are in this camp of habituation, of the habituation model, which is okay because it it does work. So with habituation, what we have traditionally done is we have a person who is afraid of something. I'll use the social anxiety example again. We have somebody who is anxious around other people, right? And that kind of generalizes to a variety of social situations. And what we would do is we would have that person engage, like, engage in something that they are anxious about with the goal of having anxiety reduction in that situation. So we would ask somebody like zero to 10, how anxious are you, you know, making a phone call to Home Depot and asking them like what time they close. Um, And the person would say a nine. So then you would have the person call Home Depot multiple times or make different phone calls, you know, to different stores and ask the same question. And with with the goal being that over time, the nine would reduce to, you know, a three, a two. And the goal there would be to show the person that the things that I'm anxious about don't need to cause anxiety because if I do them over time, the anxiety reduces. So then the pairing of anxiety with that thing, with that stimulus goes away. It totally works. However, You know, there is this new model that Michelle Krask has been really significant in developing, and she was my PhD advisor, was that actually the the part at play here is that there's new learning that occurs when you are doing exposure. So it's not just that anxiety is reducing. Yes, anxiety is reducing, but it's because you're learning something different when you're doing exposure. 
And this is that inhibitory learning model. So here's kind of, I'm going to try to talk about it in, you know, the most kind of general terms possible. It's a little bit complicated, but when you have a cue or a trigger, right? So say engaging with other people is a trigger. You're going to a party. You associate that cue with danger. So someone who has social anxiety associates other people going to a party, making a phone call with danger because maybe they'll be rejected or maybe someone will think negatively about them. So then as a result, there's so much avoidance that occurs with engaging with other people. So the goal of the inhibitory learning model is to actually teach that person that they can engage with other people and the rejection does not occur. So you want to inhibit or block the old learning that rejection does occur and that they can't handle the anxiety with this new learning that rejection either does not occur or they can tolerate the anxiety. So it's just a different way of framing the exposure. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, like, like um, functionally you're doing the same thing. You're having the person yes. do what they're scared of, uh, but the, the first model was was deconditioning a feared response to a behavior. So if you do, yes. you know, kind of like Pavlov with the dogs, like, you know, like where they condition drooling with, with the, with the bell, it's deconditioning the drooling with the bell to get again, the anxiety disconnected exactly. versus this is more so that you did this, you learned a different outcome. And because yes. of that, that reduces the anxiety. Exactly. Yes. You learn a different outcome. And if you do that, over and over and in different types of situations, if you're able to enhance that new learning in different types of situations and the person is able to really kind of generalize that learning and say, okay, so engaging with other people does not necessarily mean danger. And therefore, as a result, the anxiety reduces, but you're not just deconditioning the anxiety. You want that new learning to happen. Um, and so as a result, actually, we don't necessarily care about in the moment exposure, anxiety reduction. So with the habituation model, we would never let somebody leave a session without having anxiety reduction following an exposure. And we'd always want somebody to have anxiety reduction while they're doing exposure for homework. In this inhibitory learning model, we actually don't care about anxiety reduction in the moment exposure. We care about it overall, over the course of treatment. So if somebody is engaging in, in an exposure, say, you know, they have to call Home Depot, they think the person on the phone is going to say something nasty to them or judgmental to them, and their anxiety is a nine, if they can get off the phone call and say, the person that I spoke with did not say anything negative to me, did not judge me, did not sound like they judged me, but my anxiety is still a nine, that's okay. It's okay that their anxiety is still high as long as they can see that the feared outcome did not happen. Hmm. So does it, does it matter? Cause in the traditional model, right? The higher the anxiety is, you would assume a, a bigger therapeutic effect. And, um, we don't have to go into flooding versus gradual exposure, but you know, there was this concept with flooding where you really brought people to really scary things in one giant sitting to break it. So do you guys care about how high the anxiety is when you're doing an exposure is a five, the same as a 10? Yeah, we really don't care. We really don't care how intense the anxiety is because if there's even a little bit of anxiety and the person believes to some extent that the feared outcome will occur, as long as they see that it doesn't, whether their anxiety is a 10 or a four, then the job is being done. Hmm. And what are you finding effective? Is it just as effective just exposing to five to sevens as it is doing, you know, a seven to a 10? So yeah, we're seeing that it, it is just as effective. I mean, we do want to do a range of exposures um, in terms of difficulty because we want to make sure that people are engaging in things that they actually really are avoiding or really are afraid of. But if we over time do, you know, several sevens, fives, eights, twos, then it does work. And, you know, when we were doing the traditional habituation model, we started with a fear hierarchy, you know, where we actually had people make a list of, you know, the things that they were afraid of and how afraid they made them. So we would have them rate each of the exposures, you know, zero to 10 and kind of do exposures in that way. 
But with the inhibitory learning model, we actually don't ask people how scared, you know, that the exposure is on their exposure list. We call it an exposure list instead of a hierarchy. We actually don't really care how anxious each of those exposure items would make them because we want to just do a variety. It's like pulling an exposure out of a hat, basically. Hmm. So are you familiar with like behavior experiments? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how is this any, so a behavior experiment is when, um, you think something is going to go one way or you're not sure how it's going to go. So you have the person do the behavior to see the outcome. Like I haven't talked to my friend Jill in a long time. I don't think she'll respond to me if I text to her. So the text her. So the experiment would be, well, text Jill and Mm -hmm. let's see what happens and we'll find out. How is, how is this any different than uh, a behavioral experiment? So it's similar to a behavioral experiment, except we're doing the same thing, except we always want to, before we do the behavioral experiment, know what we're testing out. That is the absolute most important thing about doing exposures in this way, is we need to know what is it that you're afraid of happening? Can we test it out? So with a behavioral experiment, you're saying, you know, you want to text your friend Jill, Jill may not respond to you. Let's see what happens. Here we would say the same thing, except we would really want to highlight what is it that you're afraid of by texting Jill? You know, I'm afraid that Jill won't respond to me. So then we would need to test that out. Uh, You know, is Jill not going to respond to you? Let's see. So that's the behavioral experiment with being very specific about what it is that the person is afraid is going to happen. Okay. Um, so the, the traditional model that, that people have been using for years is that we try and get something with enough heat, meaning that the anxiety number is high enough. Uh, we would have them do it over and over again. And at the end, uh, they habituate, which means that the anxiety drops and they do that over days and repetition over days and days and days. And that, and that goes away. What would this, so if somebody were to come to you and go on this inhibitory learning model, what would that type of treatment look like? So it would look, so it would look like they would come in, we would explain the rationale of exposure. Then instead of doing a hierarchy, we would do something called an exposure list and we would get, you know, a variety of different aspects of what makes a person anxious. So we can come up with a comprehensive list. And if it's okay, I'm going to pull up, um, a list that I have here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to tell you what is on that list. So when we do an assessment of what someone is afraid of or what we're going to do for exposures, we want to take into account a variety of different things. So we want to ask somebody first what their feared outcome is. Always, always, what is your feared outcome? Why are you not engaging in these things? What do you think is going to happen? And honestly, sometimes for people, the feared outcome is going to be, I just don't think I can tolerate my distress doing this stuff. Sometimes people don't have an actual feared outcome of like, I'll be rejected or I'm going to die if I have a panic attack. It might just be like, I can't tolerate it. So if that's the feared outcome, that's okay because we can test that out too. Then we want to ask people about their feared thoughts or images You know, like what are the things that they are afraid to think about or what are they afraid to see? Um, Any types of safety behaviors or safety thoughts. A safety behavior is any kind of behavior that you engage in that makes you less anxious when you are about to do something that you are afraid of. So that could be something like praying, saying a mantra. Um, It could be like having somebody come with you when you go to a party standing by the food table, anything that will reduce your anxiety in the feared situations, any types of safe places, being at home, being near a hospital, being with, being, you know, at a friend's house, um, any safety objects and any feared physical sensations and specific situations and settings that, you are afraid of. So we do like a really, a really comprehensive assessment of what people are afraid of. Then we combine all of that information and come up with exposures based on that information. And why do you want to take care of, take away all these safety things? Because there was like five questions there were like safe places, (laughs) safe objects, safe thought, you know, why are we taking that all away? So we're taking that all away to show people that these objects, places, behaviors, are not needed um, to be able to face your fears and reduce anxiety. They're also 
avoidance in their own way. So if we have somebody who, for example, takes a water bottle with them everywhere that they go because they think that that water bottle will make it so they won't have a panic attack, or if they do have a panic attack, the water bottle will help them, then they'll never actually learn that having a panic attack is okay because that water bottle is the thing that they attribute their reduction in anxiety to. Mm -hmm. So we want to take away all of the potential avoidance that they have. Um, And those safety objects, places, behaviors contribute to that avoidance. So bottom line, they learned that they defeated the anxiety or they conquered it, not the water bottle. And that sounds silly that you would like, oh, well, the the water bottle conquered it, but it it really happens. I got through this because of the water bottle. I got through this because I carried my little bottle of Xanax with me. Uh, It really is a thing. It really is a thing. It really is a thing. Yeah, people, exactly. People will take, you know, prescription bottles. People will take water bottles. It could be like a little, I don't know, like a little piece of blanket or something that is soothing to them or calms them. And, you know, people attribute that, you know, I got through this anxious situation, this anxiety provoking situation because I had this thing with me. When Mm -hmm. in reality, we need them to learn that that's actually not the case. And you can get through it without those things. And so when we then come up with our exposure list, Then we do exposures in session and we send people home with homework exposures. And the way that it differs from the habituation model is that we have people vary their exposures for homework. Hmm. So we're not having them do the same thing over and over and over until habituation occurs. We're having people pick like three different exposures that they're going to do for homework, fill out specific worksheets about each of those exposures, and then that's their homework. So they can see that it generalizes to different situations. Okay. And uh, I want to jump and ask about these questions specifically. So if I forget, (laughs) make make sure to to go back there. Uh, But do you conceptualize things in the risk resource model that that's how I, I often think about anxiety? Can you say more? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically anxiety is an overestimation of risk and uh, underestimation yes. of your resources to handle it. And yes. it sounds like, you know, and I just wanted to like put it in my theory of things, because that's exactly what you're talking about. Because you keep saying you either learn that it's not as scary or it's not as bad as you think, or if it is kind of scary, that you could actually handle it. And one mm-hmm. of those is the the risk part. One of those is the resource yes. part. And often when I talk to my, my grad students, I say a lot of people, when they focus on exposure, they really focus on that risk. Yes. And they don't focus enough on the resource or, or at least the, the, when, when these, when these people are in training, cause it's very easy to say someone's scared of heights, bring them on the heights. Right. right. Makes a lot of sense. But one piece that people can miss is that, wow, we're teaching people that they are strong enough, that you are a strong person that could handle this. Yes. Yes. And we do really want to focus on the resource part of that as well, because a huge component of this is that people can tolerate the distress. And I think that a lot of people do think like, I actually don't have the ability to tolerate high anxiety or I'll experience this peak of anxiety forever. And I won't be able to come down from that. And I think, you know, in addition to someone's afraid of heights, we bring them up to the highest point and we have them exposed to that. Part of that is showing them, like, can I actually tolerate the distress? Do I have the resources? Do I have the skills, the ability to tolerate what distress comes up for me when I do do an exposure? Because even if we're testing out that the feared outcome doesn't happen, like, we also are test- we're also showing people that they can make it through these really difficult situations and actually be okay. And their anxiety does not last forever. Mm-hmm. And you just, and you also think about it, it's like, depending on the exposure, say that we're doing social anxiety exposure and, um, uh, it's about being embarrassed, right? So, you know, I'm in Manhattan, we go on the show, oh, but this is pre COVID, but so we would go on the street and we would do embarrassing things. Like we would ask yeah. people for ridiculous directions, or we would like say hi to everybody, sing at people, but inevitably there's going to be one person out of well, say a hundred or something that's yeah. actually going to get nasty because you did it. And the thing actually happened that the person's terrified of. So yeah. you can't go in there with the assumption, well, this doesn't happen. It's the idea that, okay, this is going to happen and you, and you can handle it. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Because there is always that risk that you are going to, depending on what the exposure is, like you said, you're going to run into your feared outcome. And the idea here is if you do run into your feared outcome, can you tolerate it? Is it okay? You know, were you able to make it through? We do the same thing. So when I, when I did my graduate training at UCLA, we would bring clients outside of the psychology building, stand in front of the psychology building and have them ask students or whomever was passing by, where is the psychology building and ask for directions for the psychology building. I love that exposure. Yeah. Um, I do Starbucks where people go in and ask them if they serve coffee. 
<laughs> yeah. 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 Or an- another one could be where we, you know, ask somebody to make a phone call to, for example, I don't know why I keep saying Home Depot, but we ask somebody to call Home Depot and ask them like what types of cheese they sell or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's go to the questions that you would ask. Cause it sounds like yeah. with this, you want to set up certain questions to make sure you're hitting what you think is the mechanism of change here. Yes. It's very, very important to set up the exposure and to follow up the exposure with specific questions. I mean, obviously the wording doesn't have to be specific, but you want to target certain concepts here. So before you do the exposure, you always want to ask somebody, what is it that we're testing out? And you want the client to answer for you. Of course, you can help them, but it's really important to have the client be the one that gives you these answers because that actually, that's the way to consolidate learning and that's the way for someone to actually really have that inhibitory learning process work. So we always want to ask, what is it that you're testing out? Are you testing out that somebody is going to say something nasty to you? Are you testing out that, you know, you can have a cup of coffee and not have a heart attack? Like, what, are, what is it that we're testing out? And we want to have that person, the client, tell you what it is that they're testing out. And after you ask that question, you want to ask them, how likely do you think it is that your feared outcome will occur? Zero to 10. And have them rate that. And then you ask them, how, do you, how will you know if it occurs? Okay. Okay. And then we have them kind of define what would it look like, you know, for you to have your feared outcome occur. Then you do the exposure. Following the exposure, immediately you ask them, did your feared outcome happen? Right away. And they, you know, you obviously, again, want them to answer the question. And then you say, how do you know? How do you know that your feared outcome either happened or didn't? And if they say that it did, say somebody, you know, say they were outside of Franz Hall at UCLA, they asked for directions to Franz Hall, someone was like, it's right behind you. Come on. What's wrong with you? Then you ask them, did, were you able to tolerate the feared outcome? How do you know? Okay. So we always want to know, did it happen? How do you know? If it did happen and were you able to tolerate it? How do you know? Hmm. And then after that, we ask, how likely do you think the feared outcome would happen? How likely would it be that the feared outcome occurs if you do it again? So, I mean, literally mapped down to that risk resource model. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And, yeah. and see, and, and that's going back to the, the beginning of our conversation. Why is this all still CBT, right? Yeah. Is because it's coming on the same exact cognitive model um, yes. that you're trying to do the risk resource. And some people try and uh, have you rational, r- rationalize out of the risk and, you know, that you have enough resource versus let's just learn it by doing it. Exactly. Exactly. It's both. It's both. And it's so important that following exposure, we, you know, well, pre and post exposure, we ask these types of questions, because if you just have somebody go out and do the exposure, that's great. And that, you know, to some extent will work, but we actually want people to be able to say, like, I know that this didn't happen because I asked for directions and someone gave them to me and I saw no indication that they were judging me. Um, you know, and no, that, that, that makes sense. Cause some people, their mind will automatically, you know, get, get the learning, but other people need some guidance in order for them to see the lesson that they, that they learned. And that's with all, all learning. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Not just with here. So, uh, you, you know, you, you had mentioned trauma narratives before and, and, and trauma work. Um, what is the learning that that's going on by doing those exposures that helps the person, uh, to recovery? Yeah. So when we think of like prolonged exposure for people with PTSD or people you know, who have experienced a trauma. So the learning that is going to occur there is that they is that the person can you know, retell their trauma narrative and they can tolerate the distress associated with telling that trauma narrative and that, you know, it's not dangerous to kind of like talk about or revisit that trauma narrative because with the trauma narrative in particular, and then we can talk about the outside exposure piece in a second, you know, a lot of people will avoid 
the trauma memory in and of itself. I don't want to think about it. It's gone. I'm pushing it away. Right. Because thinking about it means that I will have like a huge response or, you know, I'm going to crumble. Something bad will happen. And I worked at the VA, um, in Los Angeles while I was on internship. And I did a lot of this work with veterans. And, you know, the idea here is that, you know, I am anticipating that I won't be able to talk about this trauma narrative. I won't be able to do the trauma, you know, the prolonged exposure component of this treatment because I will just decompensate. Like I'm going to have an intense emotion. It won't go away. I won't be able to do this. And it shows people that they actually can tolerate the distress associated with this trauma memory. There's also a habituation component to prolonged exposure still that we want as well. Um, that, you know, over time, the anxiety does reduce mm. as a result of going over this trauma memory. Oh, so that, that actually makes me think of a question. So is it that you guys are saying that inhibitory learning and habituation is happening? Is just that the, the inhibitory learning is the, the more important part? Like is it two different pathways that are happening at the same time? So both are, yeah, so both are happening. We are saying that both are happening. However, you know, the inhibitory learning component is the driving, we're saying that's like the driving mechanism to anxiety reduction um, in exposure, but habituation will inevitably occur also over time. Um, But particularly with trauma, so like this was so trauma being isolated, PTSD being isolated and doing prolonged exposure, we actually really do want to focus on habituation as well. Hmm. And, and any other type of work that you would you would focus on both or is it mostly with with trauma? I would say it's mostly with trauma and with prolonged exposure. We're still doing prolonged exposure in the same way that we've always done it, which is focusing on the habituation component. And then we add in the inhibitory learning component there as well. OK, and then um I'm not sure how much OCD work that you do, but th- does this also pertain t- uh, to OCD treatment? Yeah, it definitely pertains to OCD treatment. So um, I have done some work, particularly with in my um, in my role at CBT California before I moved to Boston with a couple of teens with OCD, and we do do the inhibitory learning model with OCD as well. So you know, can you tolerate the distress associated with touching a toilet and not washing your hands? You know, how long does it take for the distress to over time go away? Can you tolerate that intense distress that happens in the moment? We can't really test out, does your feared outcome occur with OCD? Because with OCD, it may be, you know, I touch this toilet and then in 20 years, I'm going to get cancer. So we can't test out whether in 20 years cancer happens. What we can test out is can you tolerate the distress in the moment? Mm -hmm. And and tolerate the uncertainty. Exactly. And especially during these times, uncertainty tolerance is a very hot topic because we (laughs) are in a world of uncertainty. Yes. Yes, we are. We are in a world of uncertainty. And so if we were to think about, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder or kind of like you know, engaging in compulsions as a result of being anxious about COVID. That's a whole nother, it's a whole different ball game there, you know, because we actually have a lot of uncertainty when it comes to COVID and, you know, what actually prevents COVID and all of that. So yes, <laughs> we are in a world of uncertainty right now. All right. So a- another topic that we were going to talk about today was uh, looking at pa- positive affect and treatment. But before we jump into there, was there anything else about inhibitory learning that you think it's important for people to know about? Or did we cover that pretty well? I think we covered it pretty well. I-, I would say like, if anything, it sounds really complicated and it sounds really scary. And, you know, once you break it down and if you're working with a clinician, um, doing this work, it's really effective and it will not feel as complicated or as scary, you know, when you are working in conjunction with someone that knows what they're Mm -hmm. doing and knows how to do this. I I often call it the, you know, the kid getting a shot, like, you know, the the kid goes to the doctor and they're freaking out about the shot. And then after they get the shot and you say, well, how bad was it? And they say, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. Um, And oftentimes I explain that to people with exposures. I talk about it and I say, okay, next week, maybe we'll start doing exposures. But I said, just remember that the anticipatory anxiety of, of starting it is generally higher than actually doing the exposure, particularly if you're doing it with someone who's well-trained and is going to, is going to do it correctly. Absolutely. And this is the stuff that works, you know, and I always tell, um, I always tell patients this too, that like, this is the thing that is going to work. We have so much data that shows that it works, you know, and you know, this is the thing that will make you feel better over time. It's going to be difficult in the beginning and you will see that it really, really does work. 
Mm-hmm. Actually, before we jump in, I actually thought of, thought of a question. So uh, go, going back to the, the trauma work, you know, there's cognitive processing therapy yeah. that goes on too. Do you guys implement any, any of that into the treatment as well? Or is it really just focusing on the exposure? For trauma treatment? So, mm-hmm. I mean, I think we kind of use both of the treatments, but for different people. So, you know, we use prolonged exposure for, um, people with PTSD who have a really, who have, you know, a trauma memory that is really distinct that they are able to say, this is the thing that is causing me distress. Whereas when, you know, we have cognitive processing therapy, I think though cognitive processing therapy is more for the people who either don't have a distinct trauma, have multiple traumas, or for people that are really kind of stuck in their thoughts about, you know, the world, themselves, safety, all of those types of things. And, you know, working on their cognitions as it relates to the trauma is where the work will happen. So we do do cognitive processing therapy. I don't really kind of, I don't combine them. Mm-hmm. I would say the exposure part of cognitive processing therapy would be the trauma narrative session, which is session four, I think. Um, and you know, now with cognitive, with the new data and cognitive processing therapy, they're saying we don't even, they don't even need to do (laughs) the trauma narrative anymore for there to be results. So I would, yeah, I would say that they are, they are separate and for different presentations of PTSD. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, onto the, the, you know, positive affect and treatment, what was the work that you were, you were doing there and why does it matter? Yeah. So positive affect treatment is this new treatment that, um, my PhD advisor, Michelle Krask has been working on for quite, for several years. Um, I kind of, I started working with her when it was being developed and I, you know, took that treatment and turned it into my dissertation and I'll explain kind of what it is. So positive affect treatment is more of a trans diagnostic treatment, meaning that it is not intended to treat one specific anxiety disorder or depression. We're kind of taking it and using it for all of the above. We're hoping that it targets a deficit in positive affect, which is you know, exhibited in people with a variety of anxiety disorders and depression. And when we think about a deficit in positive affect, we think about, you know, a deficit in reward processing. So people with anhedonia, people who kind of don't experience joy or positive mood associated with engaging in activities. Um, So we are treating this deficit in reward processing and this deficit in positive affect with several interventions. Um, So what we are doing is there is a behavioral component, which we put first, um, as I talked about earlier. So in that behavioral component, there is pleasant event scheduling. So what we are doing there is we are asking people to, you know, come up with activities that they either used to enjoy doing or currently enjoy doing, or that are just building mastery activities. It could be things like making your bed in the morning, brushing your teeth, you know, going to the grocery store, or it could be something like, you know, going for a hike or getting a mani-pedi or all pre-COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Things that, you know, people could engage in that would be a little difficult, but not too difficult in hopes that it will boost mood a bit. So there's a whole section on pleasant event scheduling. Um, And then following pleasant event scheduling, we have a cognitive component, which is all in an effort to kind of improve mood and increase positive affect. So we have finding the silver lining in situations. So how can you take a situation that may have been a negative situation and find the silver lining of that situation? It is anticipating the positive. So looking ahead into the future and anticipating positive things happening. And then also taking ownership of the positive. So for people who are who have a deficit in positive affect, there's a lot of like, well, this good thing happened to me because I was lucky, because the timing was right. You know, I really had nothing to do with this. It kind of just fell into my lap. And we want people to think about how did they play a role in the good things that have happened? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have, it's not a mindfulness component, but it's more of a compassion based component. So there is loving kindness, there is gratitude, generosity, and appreciative joy. So all of that combined is intended to help increase positive affect 
in people who have a deficit there. And again, that can be transdiagnostic. So there are a lot of people who would fit under that umbrella. Um, and just when you think about positive affect, negative affect, are, are you thinking about it as poles on a single dimension or are you looking at them as two different dimensions? Um, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to put people, we're trying to elevate people's positive affect. So we're trying to target positive affect without really, we're not trying to decrease negative affect. We're trying to increase positive affect, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, it sounds like a lot of these techniques though, even though there's like, um, some of them are seem pure more towards like the positive side, but some of them actually are techniques for reducing negative affect too, like finding the silver lining. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. that, that also helps decrease negative, negative affect. And same thing with pleasant event scheduling also decreases negative affect, but the way that we are framing it with the patient is we're not actual, we're trying to frame it in a way that will purely focus on the positive affect. So for example, with the pleasant event scheduling, we are asking people to recount the activities that they engaged in and what were the positive emotions that they experienced? What were the hmm. sights, the sounds, the smells that felt good? You know, what was your mood following the event? So we're not asking them to kind of focus on what wasn't bad about it. We're asking them to focus on what was nice about it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, what have you found adding this component into, into the, into treatment? So the, the research is still currently being done actually in my graduate lab. Um, they, so people, so my advisor has found over time that, you know, positive affect treatment does indeed improve positive affect and therefore decrease symptoms of anxiety disorders and depression. My research in particular, I took this treatment and made it into a self-guided version um, for people with a variety of anxiety disorders and depression and had them kind of take this self-guided manual and work through the treatment on their own. Um, and so what I found was that for people with mild to moderate depression and anxiety, had a significant um, reduction in symptoms um, associated with their anxiety disorder or depression. Because it was a self-guided version, it was a little bit more difficult for people who had more severe anxiety or depression and for people who had comorbid personality disorders, it was difficult as well. Mm -hmm. um, but for the self-guided version, we found that it did work for people who were on the mild to moderate scale. Uh, is that something that people could access or was it just for the study? So right now, so right now we are putting the, we're putting a, a client workbook together. Oh, cool. um, we're working on that currently. So probably within the next, you know, several months to a year, people will be able to access that. Um, and then I'm also publishing my results currently. Oh, awesome. And, and were you comparing that against the more traditional therapy or was it just against like just the control group that was getting no treatment? So for my particular dissertation, it was actually a multiple baseline experimental design. So I wasn't comparing it to anybody. We were just looking to see whether, you know, this treatment caused a reduction in symptoms following a randomized baseline period. Got it. Okay. And then I don't want to get too much into weeds, uh, uh, stats yeah, or anything, but research, did, did yeah. you, did you like look at the difference between increasing positive affect and just decreasing negative affect? Was that part of the analysis? So for my particular dissertation, no, but in the research that is going on in the lab, there's also a negative affect treatment that they are looking at as well. So looking at decreasing negative affect versus increasing positive affect. Yeah. So that is currently going on. Okay. Uh, yeah. let's say someone has no symptoms. They don't have anxiety. They don't have depression. They just want to be happier. Like life is stressful. Yeah. Um, is this totally. something that would be helpful just for like, I mean, even during COVID time, like, is this something that could be helpful for anybody or is it really clinically oriented? I absolutely believe it can be helpful for anybody. These are tools that people can use, that people can engage in, that can help improve mood, even if you don't have any symptoms, even if you don't have a diagnosable disorder, if you're just stressed, if you're feeling kind of down, I think, you know, this stuff can be used for anybody. Absolutely. It doesn't necessarily have to be done in a structured, formatted way, but any of these interventions can absolutely be helpful for anybody. All right. Um, and is there, um, any like value oriented approach? Like when you're thinking about the behaviors you're going to do, uh, is it, is it just pleasure or is it also like, well, this is based on your values. And so we should, we should factor that in as well. So the way that 
I have done it was it didn't really incorporate a values component. However, I think it can be incorporated because if somebody is thinking about, you know, a pleasant activity or even a building mastery activity, then we can think about, you know, what do you value and how can you engage in an activity that is in accordance with those values? I think that can be incorporated. Absolutely. I did not do that. We did not do that. We were looking more at, you know, in the moment, how can you boost your mood? Um, what type of activity can you engage in? But if somebody, if it makes sense for somebody to kind of have a more, you know, values based approach to their pleasant activities, I think that can be done as well. Okay. And is this adjunct, like adjunct, like say that someone's going through exposure therapy, but they're also dealing with not having enough positive affect. Is this an adjunct therapy, a standalone, or is it both? It could be adjunct and standalone. So in the real world, when we are looking at, you know, clients with a variety of different concerns that we are working with, it absolutely can be used together. Um, you can do exposure, you can do some interventions related to the positive affect treatment. Um, I do that in my own clinical work. I do kind of a combination of what makes sense for someone based on their presentation and what make, you know, based on their conceptualization in the research world, separate. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right. But I mean, if you could do me a favor when this does come out for people to get it, I would love to, you know, put this in the notes or get it out there. So, so people could actually get their hands on this health help book for, for, you know, more mild symptoms or just trying to live a happier life. Absolutely. I will. Yeah, definitely. We are, we are in the very early stages of putting it together. So it will be, it will be a little bit of time, but yes, I will definitely let you know. Yeah. It always takes time, doesn't it? Yes. It takes time to, <laughs> it's to it's, it's never quick. <laughs> Okay. Um, so if people are interested in, in keeping track on potentially like what you're doing or keep track on that study or the inhibitory learning model, where can they, uh, like log into online to learn more about this stuff? Yeah. So for me in particular, if people are interested in um, contacting me or seeing what I'm up to, I, I currently am working at the Concord Center. It's in Concord, Massachusetts. I've been in LA for 10 years and now I'm in Massachusetts. Um, so the recent website move, is actually like a real recent move, like three weeks ago, like, th like, Yes, three weeks ago tomorrow. So very yeah, so, recent move. Yeah. Congratulations um, on the move. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the website for the Concord Center is ConcordCBT.com. Um, so that's where they can find me. Um, and and yes, and there in terms of access to these resources or exposure resources, the Treatments That Work series that are, is put out by Oxford University Press, I would say is the go-to for those types of resources. They have client workbooks that are fantastic. Like you can take yourself through a course of CBT in this client, in these client workbooks, and you can find a wide array of different treatments for different anxiety disorders. Hmm. There's a social anxiety workbook. There's a panic workbook. There's a, you know, managing your worry and anxiety workbook. There's a depression workbook. They're all out there and they're fantastic. And they're all written by the experts in the field. Awesome. And uh, any other resources that, um, that, that you recommend for people? Other than those books, I mean, I, d I don't think so. I would say that is your go-to. I would hmm. say, you know, going to those treatments that work, that's the series that it's, that it's called, those books would be really beneficial if anybody's interested in starting to do this work on their own. Um, if somebody's interested in finding a really good CBT therapist, then the, you know, a cat, um, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the abct.com, their website, they can find a really good CBT therapist through that website as well. Okay. Oh, and, and also the Academy that you brought up, the, um, they, they also have a, uh, a, a database for people that are, that are certified. Yes. Um, yes. The Academy of Cognitive Therapy. Yeah. Well. Um, and then, um, is there any way to keep track of this, this positive affect treatment or is it just so new? It's just like, just kind of <laughs> hold a bit and, and, and we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, it's really, it's very new. I mean, mm. there are some recently published articles by my advisor. So anything by Michelle Krask, you can find um, C-R-A-S-K-E. She's doing the bulk of that research at UCLA. So stay tuned for the results there and for this treatment workbook that's coming out. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. I mean, I, I love this conversation and, uh, you know, I know about the inhibitory learning model, but I, I mean, I, I feel like I got a whole bunch of new facts and new ways of seeing how to actually employ it in my practice. Um, and hopefully, uh, clients 
will see that um, approaching their fears or, or their distress is going to help them heal rather than avoiding it. And then also very cool conversation about looking at this other aspect that, that people often forget about, which is not just getting rid of symptoms or getting rid of the negative part and feeling bad, but also like, how can we feel better? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm very happy that our field is focusing so much on feeling better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And thank you so much for having me. This was, this was awesome.